calendar if you haven't seen it. Your classes have changed a little bit so that everything works well. And uh, remember, if I don't see you here, I'll put you in any practice. Okay, so I expect you guys to be here. Okay, and I'll see you next week. I'll let Tommy start. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, everyone, and for coming to the seminar. I believe this is your second seminar of the year. So I think Yannette presented last week and I'm gonna follow her. Um, very briefly to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm an assistant professor at UCSF. I've been at UCSF for three years now and I've been working with the USF practicum program for almost that entire time. Um, your program is a one-year program that flies by very fast and I'm always amazed to see how much you guys learn and what you can do by the end of your program. Um, so the outline of my talk will be, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself and what I do in terms of research and clinical work, which mainly focuses in medical imaging and radiation therapy. And then I'll jump into three areas of research which I think are interesting to the, uh, you guys as data science students. So that includes auto segmentation, auto planning for radiation therapy, and some synthetic image generation that is also useful in radiation therapy. And then at the end, I'll talk about um, some past UCSF practicum projects and then future ones. Uh, and I think this will nicely lead into next week. Uh, I hope to be uh, present uh, on Friday, like uh, in the conference room during the pitches, and I'd love to meet some of you guys then. Um, so that's kind of the goal for this talk. This is the overarching outline. Um, I always begin my talks by making acknowledgments, and uh, a lot of the stuff that I do is part of a big team, uh, which wouldn't have been possible without them. Uh, and I'm highlighting here uh, Yannette and the practicum uh, program because um, I've had a lot of success with um, UMaster students and, and we've done a lot of cool projects that I'd like to continue in the future. Okay, but let's go uh, a little bit back. So before UCSF uh, in 2018, um, I was doing my PhD work uh, in Western University, London, Ontario. And um, there's an institute there called Robarts Research Institute, which applies medical imaging to a variety of tasks. And medical imaging includes uh, CT, MRI, ultrasound, PET, so a variety of, of technologies. And during my time there, I actually saw the change of artificial intelligence uh, taking over the medical imaging realm so I started my PhD in 2015, and after two years into it, uh, almost every new program or project that was being taken on had some type of data science into it. So I worked as a researcher and I was funded by the Breast Cancer Society of Canada. Um, I've done a lot of work on breast cancer detection and uh, developing x-ray detectors for mammography. Uh, you know, a lot of this work is already published um, in uh, proceedings and medical physics journals. Uh, and it really spans the scope of developing hardware and software for these x-ray detectors, um, integrating them into electronics, and then also designing and building prototypes uh, for these mammography detectors. And a little bit of the background of what this looks like is uh, we're modeling the processes which are going on in generating a mammogram. So from incident x-rays on a detector to generation of secondary quanta, which are essentially electrons, and then capturing that signal, which produces an image. Um, so a lot of my PhD work started in this theoretical background of signal processing, uh, understanding signal and noise in images, and it very quickly transitioned into um, image analysis and a lot of data science and artificial intelligence came along with that. So this is a mammogram here on the left, and uh, what this mammogram shows uh, are 
uh, several features that are used for diagnosis, like this mass here. Um, can you guys see my mouse? Is that, yeah, on the screen? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, thank you. Um, there are also some other features like microcalcifications. So there are some microcalcifications um, here and over here. And there's even uh, several ones that are harder to detect. And a radiologist will look at this mammogram and try and identify if this is an aggressive cancer that needs treatment or a benign cancer that is safe and does not need treatment. So in, uh, in breast cancer detection, artificial intelligence has been around for a while. And this is a paper from last year, which did a huge study looking at breast cancer screening, comparing um, AI to human observers. And these are plots of um, ROC curves, uh, which basically um, tell us how good a test is at detecting a particular task. And ideally we would want an ROC curve to look like a straight line going up to one and then to the right all across. And if you just had a diagonal, um, that would be a 50-50% chance, so like flipping a coin. And what this study showed was that for human observers, which is shown uh, in purple here, and then um, AI systems, um, the AI system was capable of outperforming human observers. And this has been uh, around for a while in, in breast cancer detection. There are a lot of tools for computer automated detection um, way before the, um, the, the increase of artificial intelligence and medical imaging took over. Um, but I think the, the real promise in the future is to translate similar capabilities to additional tasks, not just for detection of cancer, but also for um, other, um, other applications as well. But this is a really good example of how effective data science can be in medicine. Um, All right, so I'm gonna transition a little bit to UCSF and tell you guys a little bit about UCSF. Um, so I'm an assistant professor there and UCSF contains three campuses. So there's the Mount Zion campus, there's the Mission Bay campus, and then there's the Parnassus campus. So all three of these campuses um, provide radiation therapy to patients uh, from a variety of disease sites, um, brain, CNS, lung, um, GU, GI, um, a, a lot of patients are treated here in the Bay Area at these three sites. Now, these three sites uh, have a lot of technology um, that they use to treat these patients. So this just shows the, the, the breadth of a different uh, radiation technology equipment. And I'll jump into a couple of them um, as I progress through my talk. Uh, but there's a lot of data that's being collected during each treatment and before treatment and also after treatment. So there's a lot of data that's generated by each one of these systems. Uh, also at UCSF, um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Bay Area Science Festival that I participated in last year. Um, it was the first time it was virtual, but we had a session of uh, teaching uh, young kids about radiation therapy. And we call one of our machines, the dancing robot. And this is what a bunch of physicists look like when they're trying to do the robot dance. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, outreach events like this are a big part of our department. And uh, we really like to take, uh, take pride in that. Okay, um, so radiation therapy. So this is a linear accelerator, uh, which uh, is used to generate uh, therapeutic radiation beams. So this is radiation that's beneficial to the patients in treating cancer. Um, it's very common to have this sort of setup where the patient is lying prone and this uh, machine actually rotates and the couch also rotates around the patient to best deliver the, uh, the therapy to them. Uh, so there are uh, various forms of this same machine. So this is uh, a cyber knife machine. So this is more of a robotic 
uh, system, but it has uh, real-time tracking capabilities, which include X-ray imaging. Um, and there are other uh, tracking capabilities during treatment, uh, such as MRI. And all of this is important because this is data that's being collected during patient treatment. And there's a wealth of information there that we can use to help guide and improve the treatment that the patients are already delivering, are already receiving. Um, we could uh, alter their future treatment, um, or we can earlier detect uh, changes that they are about to undergo. Uh, this is a gamma knife system. Um, so this is particularly for brain treatments uh, where a patient lies on this couch and there are radioactive sources around them. Um, and we very carefully deliver high doses of radiation to treat uh, brain tumors. And this has been shown to be very effective. So all of this equipment is available at UCSF. And um, again, a lot of data and a lot of research opportunities that come along with it. So let's go a little bit uh, very briefly through the clinical workflow of a radiation treatment. Um, on the left is diagnosis. So for breast cancer, this would be uh, like the breast cancer screening program that I mentioned at the beginning. So this is diagnosis of, of treatment that's necessary. But right after that diagnosis, um, there is uh, a cascade of steps where each involves a lot of generation of data. So there's further imaging. Here, uh, CT imaging is, uh, is indicated, but MR and PET uh, is also used. All of that imaging is um, annotated, it's uh, contoured, it's labeled, it's, uh, tr it, we try to structure it in a way that is useful. Um, and that structuring is a big part of the manual labor that uh, attendings, doctors, and physicists are a part of. Uh, following the structuring of the data, then there is an actual treatment plan. So there is um, a, de a determination of how to best deliver this therapy. So all of the equipment that I showed earlier, um, they take certain inputs and parameters, and that's all determined at this stage. And we have to essentially program those systems to deliver a personalized treatment for each of the patients. Following that, we do a lot of testing. Um, and verification of the plan. So there is a verification stage. So additional uh, data is collected, additional tests are run. And again, that's all saved for each patient. And then eventually we get to the stage of treating the patient, but even during that treatment stage, um, there are images that are required to set up the patient. Um, there, uh, there's a lot of information that goes into it. Um, so all of this to say that I think there's a place for a data scientist in each one of these stages. Um, radiation therapy uh, is a very unique field because there are physicists like myself that work together with doctors to try and come up with new solutions. Uh, but because it's be turned into such a data rich field, uh, I find myself becoming more of a data scientist than a physicist. I find myself trying to ask, how do I use this data that I have a lot of uh, to guide better treatments? And really, um, it's somebody like you that I need to work with to answer those questions, um, not necessarily develop a new x-ray detector but how do I use all that data to make a better decision about what to do in the future? Okay, so the three areas that I've highlighted for this talk um, are, are outlined here. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about auto segmentation, which really plays into the structure contouring stage, a little bit about auto planning, and then um, synthetic image generation, which I mentioned, um, that really comes in during patient treatment. So if we can create some synthetic images before the patient comes in, we can help guide their treatment a little bit better. 
So let's jump into each one of these uh, stages together. All right, so auto segmentation. Okay, so brain metastases um, uh, are very common uh, in cancer patients. They are common uh, as a secondary, like a malignancy that comes off of a primary cancer. So for example, for breast and for lung, the, uh, the number one spot for malignancies are metastases in the brain. And the brain segmentation is a very time consuming task because um, the, the targets uh, are, are different sizes as shown here. Um, they're also, uh, they can also be anywhere in the brain. Um, and sometimes the cores of these targets are necrotic, which means that they show up not as nice bright circles, but as this heterogeneous complicated uh, thing, which is hard to uh, classify. And here I'm just showing some examples of uh, what these brain mets look like in MRI images of patients that have been administered a contrast agent to help the lesion appear as bright. Um, so that's why uh, the brain mets that are segmented here, that's why they have that bright enhancement is because they've been giving a contrast agent. Uh, just a few more examples. Uh, again, these lesions can span anywhere from a single brain met to Sometimes we treat 50 brain mets in the brain in a single time. Um, after a patient has this treatment, uh, sometimes they reoccur. So there is a second treatment and a third treatment. And um, each one of those treatments requires additional segmentation, additional contouring, which again is very time consuming. And um, auto segmentation can at least offer some uh, potential for efficiency there. So uh, previously, uh, I worked on a brain and ventricle segmentation pipeline. So uh, an MR image is an input. Uh, we perform uh, what we call skull stripping, where we remove the skull, and now we just have um, the brain in the image. And then from the, this is the input to a second model, and then we can segment the ventricles uh, in this patient. Um, the reason why we segment the ventricles is because it's a useful indicator of patient prognosis and how they're doing. Uh, so that volume of their ventricle over time is a, is a useful, is a useful metric. And here's again, some examples of, uh, of a mask and the prediction from our model. Um, we evaluated, uh, several architectures, uh, based off of percent volume differences between the mask and the prediction, but then also dice score and MR and CT images. And then we also did this uh, with transfer learning um, using an Atlas-based model, um, and then also some fine-tuned data uh, to help improve um, our model prediction. So this pipeline was applied to the brain met uh, task and here at UCSF, we have a very large data set of uh, 2,000, over 2,000 patients that have been treated in the past, um, I don't know, uh, 20 plus years. Um, there are over 10,000 brain mets, um, and they have um, a, a very diverse presentation. Here I'm, I'm showing um, a residual net um, a network that we used for our for our training, and I just want to jump into some of the results and show you uh, what we were able to do. So, first we started by grouping our data sets based off of if we have a single met, uh, and then we looked at the volume of those mets, and what this shows is that. There are actually, for single MET cases, there are large volumes like 10 cc's um, and five cc's, um, but for multiple METs like four to five or all of the data sets, most of the METs are very small. They're in the one cc range. And that'll, uh, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, and then this is a heat map of where the brain METs present in the brain. 
And um, this is just showing an axial, sagittal, and coronal slice of a probability of occurrence of these brain, map, brain meds in the brain. But we grouped our uh, data set into different models, and we compared a general model trained on all data sets versus task specific data sets and looked at their dice score. And then we also looked at uh, the dependence on size and dice score. And what we found was that uh, our models weren't performing as well for smaller size brain mets. Let me show you some case examples. So here's a, an example of a large brain met that appears very bright in the MR image. You can see that over here. And this is what the um, radiologist contoured and that shows there. And this is our prediction from our deep learning model. And that looks really good. But when you have a small brain met, it's uh, really hard to see in this image, but it's actually small and it, it is white. It's enhanced. It appears over here as shown in the task. Uh, the prediction wasn't able, the model wasn't able to detect a small brain map. Um, and similarly, when you have lack of enhancement, so there's a brain met right here, but it appears as black or a signal void, then uh, here it's actually labeled as a brain met. Uh, the model cannot detect that because it's looking for those bright regions um, because that's the way that it most commonly presents. So majority of the data has that enhancement, uh, but there are very few cases when this appears and when that happens, uh, we don't perform as well. So here are some more complicated cases when um, our model performed really well. Uh, again, these are multiple brain mats near each other um, at the cerebellum, different parts of the brain, and we're able to segment them some are on the periphery of the brain and they're performing really well. Uh, so this is a good case. Some poor cases are when the brain mets get really small, we're missing them. And here's one when you have a necrotic core. So there is a void in the center. And the way that we contour them is we contour the entire area, including the void, but the model only detects the bright areas. And it actually labels the dark part as not a uh, tumor. And um, that's, that was, that's an interesting finding because it's doing its job. It's identifying where there is a signal enhancement, um, but it needs further post-processing to properly label it as tumor. So this was a really exciting project getting into this data set and looking at the capabilities that we could achieve in terms of auto segmentation. And um, the next stage was really to look at longitudinal data, so multiple treatments. And we very quickly ran into uh, some, uh, some data set issues. So um, for example, for recurrent treatments, um, some of our data didn't have all of their brain mets labeled, uh, which were previously treated. Um, so this really made it difficult to, to train and to uh, do a proper comparison in terms of what the model, what the model was achieving. And um, we're working on, on fixing this and we have to get a little bit creative on how to augment this data set. Again, it's 2000 cases, it's, uh, it's a lot of patients. So um, it's, it's an interesting problem to look at. But uh, the take home message from the auto segmentation project that I wanna leave with you guys is that um, it's, this is a, a very useful application of uh, data science and deep learning uh, to help radiation therapy be more efficient. Um, and this will be a good tool for initializing the segmentation process. Uh, I don't think it would be a standalone tool. We would still need physicists and uh, doctors to fine tune these, um, these segmentations. And really uh, an interesting area of research is how best to integrate the workflow of AI models with uh, the clinician um, use of it. Um, so the, the better you can, the better we can do that, uh, the more uptake there will be of this new technology. 
as opposed to just uh, giving uh, an, like a, a segmentation, it would be great to have a way of interacting with the tool to fine tune the segmentation. So current, uh, the current models that we tried worked really well for large brain mets and, there was, and where there was enhancement in the MRI, um, but it didn't work that well, of course, with smaller brain mets and when we had missing segmentations of recurrent cases. Um, so we'll be looking at that in the future. Okay. So to segue into the second project. So this is auto planning. Um, so jumping, shifting gears from segmentation, uh, let's assume that we already have our segmented target and we wanna treat it. The way this works, uh, well, so uh, researchers at UCSF, uh, like uh, Dr. Ma has looked at this for a while and um, there's been a lot of work that's tried to come up with planning approaches for these uh, treatments. Um, and we've submitted um, uh, an abstract to a conference, uh, American Radium Society, which is happening uh, in a couple of weeks. And a, a lot of this work is being driven by uh, a USF student, Christopher, uh, who's, uh, who's been great at developing the code for, uh, for this study. Okay, so how does this work? So we have our MR images uh, here on the left with our segmentation, and then we have our treatment. Now, a patient normally has to come in at 7 a.m. To, to get this MR, and they don't receive treatment normally until 7 p.m. So there is this 12-hour wait that they're essentially uh, waiting for us to prepare their treatment, perform the segmentation, perform the planning. And what takes the longest is the planning part in a lot of cases. Uh, so this means you're you know, you're trying to work with the treatment software and determine which parameters are the best parameters for this particular case. Um, and when it comes to gamma knife treatments, this particular machine, um, the parameters that we're talking about are these shots. So these placements of where we're gonna put the radiation. And each one of these shots uh, has a particular weight, has a location, has other parameters, has other settings. So for each case like this one, we're looking at like a hundred features that have to be optimized uh, before the treatment can be delivered. Um, and that's where we're using deep learning to try and predict what the optimum parameters are for these treatments. So we have a data set of approximately 250 cases that have been previously treated. And we're focusing on cases that have only a single target. So previously with the brain mets, there are multiple targets and it's really a multi-target segmentation task. This is a treatment of a single site, um, which, uh, which is what we plan for this to make it simpler and uh, see if we can achieve this. So our inputs to our models, we have 3D data sets. So the MR images, that's a 3D a volume. Uh, the targets are 3D contours and volumes. And then there are also organs at risk, which we try and avoid. And here is a snapshot of what those look like. So this is the MR image. Here we have our target segmented. Um, there's a brain stem, which is right next to the target. And then there's a cochlea, which is also right next to it. And that's what we have contoured here. So during treatment planning, the goal is to try and get all of the dose inside this target while getting almost none of the dose or as little as, it, as possible to these organs at risk. And you can see that it's challenging because that they're right next to each other. And um, we follow very specific dose limits when we're trying to treat these targets. Anyways, um, ultimately what the machine requires to deliver treatment are the number of shots, where these shots are positioned, their weights, their collimator settings. So those are the parameters that we have to tune. And that's what we were trying to predict with our 250 cases. To not spend too much time on this, we looked at uh, machine learning and deep learning. Um, so we extracted radiomic features um, created a linear regression model using those radiomic features to predict number of shots. And here we're showing um, some of the features of importance 
and the performance in terms of training and testing. And then we also did a similar thing with a deep learning model um, showing that deep learning outperformed uh, the simple machine learning um, prediction uh, for, uh, for a number of shots. And in the future, we're expanding this to predicting uh, multiple parameters, not just number of shots. But this has uh, never been done before. Uh, so being able to predict these treatment parameters has always been seen as an art that physicists and physicians possessed. Um, it's a little bit tricky and you have to understand how the system behaves so that you can, you can create um, a good treatment. Um, but there is, I think, a, a lot of potential for uh, us to use data science and determine these parameters uh, quicker so that patients don't have to wait 12 hours in a hospital to receive their treatments after their imaging is done. Um, and our initial comparison with machine learning and deep learning shows that we can achieve a mean absolute error of less than one for the number of shots. Which is, um, which is good. And um, together with Yannette and Christopher, we're coming up with some uh, GAN models to predict multiple parameters and using an image to image space for uh, transferring uh, this data. So uh, that's, that's really exciting work that Christopher uh, is leading. Okay. How am I doing with time? I think we're good. Okay. So the last project uh, that I want to talk to you about is how we can use synthetic x-ray images uh, during patient treatment. And since I mentioned uh, GANs a little bit, um, this is an area where, uh, where GANs kind of perform the best and that's what we're, we've been utilizing. Um, so this work uh, was motivated by some previous publications that I had, which were which I was looking at the effect of image quality tracking performance during radiation therapy, and um, we've uh, we're going to be presenting uh, an abstract at American Radium Society on this work, and we're writing a paper. Uh, showing the results of this work. Um, and this is being led by Si Shang, um, who I think is, is gonna be graduating or is, is currently graduating. And um, he's, been, uh, he's been leading this effort and has done a great job. So previously I looked at uh, some phantom work and um, looking at image quality and how it affects treatments. Um, so these are CT images at different doses. And you can see the bottom one is kind of noisier and the top one is less noisy um, due to the effect of using higher dose. And similarly for um, X-ray images, which is this bottom row here, as you reduce the dose, um, the quality of the X-ray image uh, reduces. And then as you increase the dose, uh, it gets better unless you go too far and then the detector is saturated. Uh, but uh, I, I was able to show that this effect in image quality does affect tracking capability. So all of this is to say that how your x-ray images look really impacts your ability to track a tumor during treatment. So let me again pause and uh, describe what I mean by tracking a tumor during treatment. So as part of the workflow in radiation therapy, a patient would receive a 4D CT, which is what's shown here. So this is a sagittal slice of a lung tumor that's gonna be treated. And you can see the lung tumor uh, shows very clearly in a CT image um, during their breathing uh, phases uh, for this patient. So what we do to track this tumor during treatment, uh, because we wanna avoid delivering radiation to uh, the healthy part of the lung, we want to keep treating this, uh, the tumor, but it's moving while the patient breathes. So uh, these uh, CTs are converted into 2D planar images, which we call DRRs. And that's what they look like here uh, from two different angles. Uh, now the tumor is a lot harder to see. Uh, there's this bright spot, which is used to indicate where the tumor is. 
uh, but it doesn't show up as clearly as in the original CT. And during treatment, we acquire x-ray images of the patient in the same position. And uh, here, the tumor is also difficult to see. But tracking works by being able to map these two images to one another. So registering the DRR image to the live x-ray image allows us to plan ahead of time how we're going to treat the tumor and then during treatment be able to modify our plan under this breathing motion that the patient has. So it's really dependent on the matching of the x-ray image and the DRR image. These two images uh, need to coincide accurately. And here I'm showing them side by side. So uh, real-time tracking is basically the registration of these two images. And like I mentioned earlier, um, when you have poor quality images, tracking doesn't perform as well. So the DRR, which comes from the CT, looks grainy. Um, the edges aren't as well defined. Like if you look at the ribs, the ribs uh, have much more finer edges and have a higher, um, finer detail uh, than the DRR. So really what uh, we want to do is we want to create this poor quality. We want to transfer it and add all of this missing detail that an x-ray image has, and this will improve tracking. So this, so the, this is what the project uh, was proposing to convert DRRs to synthetic x-rays and then perform tracking with the synthetic x-rays to improve it. Okay, so uh, we used um, a cycle GAN network, which is uh, described here. Um, there are various ways to train a cycle GAN using paired images, as shown here, or unpaired images, um, and they allow for some for some fun things that you can do, like this famous transferring zebra stripes onto a horse example. Um, and what's interesting about this example is that. Uh, not only did the cycle GAN model transfer the stripes onto the horse, uh, but it also transferred the gray background uh, onto the green grass that the horse is on, uh, since most zebras are in the wild safari and horses are on green grass. Um, this is an example of what a cycle GAN model can do. And we had uh, 218 image pairs um, so these were paired data sets, and they were all previously treated at UCSF. Um, and we trained a cycle GAN model to perform this sort of transformation. Not only that, we also looked at um, a, a just a, a regular a ResNet a 2D model, a GAN model, and then compared that to a cycle GAN. So Sisheng did a lot of good work in developing the code um, uh, for, for this project. And I'll just give you um, two examples of what the outputs look like. So here on the top row is an x-ray image on the top left. And then this is um, the DRR, what the DRR looks like when we are currently trying to perform uh, real-time tracking. So we're trying to register these two images. Um, and this is a case two in the bottom is a spine. Uh, case. And here the x-ray is on the left and then the DRR is on the right. So the main difference between the x-ray and the DRR, uh, again, are the loss of fine detail. So here in the spine vertebra, you can't see the edges of each, uh, each, each bony anatomy there. And same thing here with the ribs, you're not seeing the ribs. And what the cycle GAN was able to do, it was able to take this DRR image and convert it and add a lot of those fine details. So it was able to learn to add uh, edges uh, near bones and to increase the visibility of some of the ribs uh, and the bony structure here. Um, this is a very subtle difference um, that radiologists uh, are, are trained to, to pick up. Um, it, to me, it just looks like a blurry image and a not blurry image, but these fine details a lot of time make the difference between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. Um, and that's really the information that we're trying to add here. 
All right, so the take home message for this project um, is that synthetic generation of these x-rays uh, before treatment uh, will enable more effective uh, tracking of patients. And this will enhance the visualization of the targets. That's really the, the takeaway, is that by being able to more clearly uh, see in our x-rays the target, then we can better track it. And the CycleGAN network uh, was able to add the fine detail and high resolution, um, more so than a conventional method, uh, which does not use deep learning to generate those images. And we're currently developing and looking at synthetic x-rays for other sites besides just lung. So um, there's tracking for skull based on the rotation of the patient's head. Uh, treatments need to be adapted in real time. Uh, pelvis, um, there are, when you're tracking a prostate during treatment, there is motion and rotation that has to be accounted for. And obviously in the abdomen, similar to the lung, uh, respiratory motion causes uh, a lot of uh, a lot of tumors to move, and um, we think that that will also be beneficial. So that kind of uh, brings me, I guess, to the to the end of these uh, my research uh, interests here, and um, I'll take a second to talk about data science collaboration with UCSF and USF. Um, so I've been involved for the past three years uh, with USF students uh, during their practicum. And it's not just uh, myself that works with, uh, with you guys. Um, there is a large group of mentors at UCSF. Um, Dr. Gilmer Valdez, Dr. Olivier Morin are just to name a few. Um, but like myself, there are professors um, that have different types of projects, which I think you guys will hear about on Tuesday and Friday. Um, and, um, and Yannette um, and other USF uh, professors have also been very, very helpful. Um, and I've enjoyed working with past USF students. So I worked with Karim, who works at Adobe now, and Sihan uh, when I first came to UCSF. Sihan's at TikTok. And uh, this past year, I've been working with uh, Christopher and Sishang. Um, and again, I've been amazed by how much they can do and how quickly they can pick up these projects. Uh, in part, it's um, the, U the UCSF uh, infrastructure that we have laid out. A lot of the data, um, we work really hard to, to make ready for you guys uh, and to be available for training. And, uh, and then you guys do a lot of work, uh, which, which goes a, a long way. Uh, but it's not, it's not all work. Uh, so we do you know, like to have some fun when possible during social time. So uh, this was, uh, I think, Sisheng's birthday. And Sisheng and Christopher, myself and Yannette, we went out for coffee uh, on Embarcadero here. Um, and then just uh, like a week ago, uh, we were in Madrid, Spain, uh, presenting some of the research work uh, that we've done together. Um, so I think all of this goes into a successful practicum and I think it's important. And uh, to leave you guys with some future projects uh, very quickly, um, and then we can, we can take some questions and, and talk. Um, I think uh, synthetic image generation in radiation therapy is, uh, is, is very useful and there's um, a lot of potential there. Uh, so I'm, I'm growing that project to, uh, to generate other types of X-ray images, which we call dual energy. Uh, but there are also uh, a variety of images that we can generate um, and we have the data for, um, which, which is very interesting. Auto segmentation, um, that brain met data set is, is, is probably one of the largest in the world that UCSF has when it comes to brain mets. And that's because we've treated so many patients uh, with gamma knife. Um, and I'm focusing on fine tuning the segmentation models for small tasks and those complicated cases that I mentioned. Uh, auto planning, uh, again, this has never been done before when it comes to predicting planning parameters in radiation therapy. And uh, that work will be continued 
uh, by Christopher and Yannette and myself. And we think it can branch out into um, other areas as well, not just Gamma Knife. Um, some new projects that I have are uh, time series predictions. So these are uh, motion traces that we use during radiation therapy. And um, we're developing an iOS-based uh, motion sensor and uh, using uh, deep learning to predict patient motion during treatment. And then also, uh, this is a very common and uh, very useful tool for data science in our field, and that's predicting toxicity in patients. Um, so uh, proton therapy um, is being considered as a potential new equipment for us to include at UCSF. And we're working on demonstrating uh, the feasibility and the usability of proton therapy for our patients. Um, and this project will focus on predicting toxicity from proton therapy and comparing it to conventional therapy. Anyways, that's it. Thank you for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Nice questions. Hello, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the uh, the gamma knife. Um, mm -hmm. You were mentioning you have to factor in both size and location when creating your uh, program app or, or plan. Um, what seems to be more challenging in uh, being to consider the location or the size of the tumors you're trying to? Uh, yeah. And is this for the auto planning project? Is that right? Yes, I, I believe so. It was when you were talking about the, the brain stuff in the, about the middle of the presentation. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so right now, the biggest indicator for treatment parameters is the size of the target. Um, and that makes sense because a, a larger target, you're gonna need more shots. Um, to cover it. So then there are more parameters there. Um, and a smaller target, you need fewer shots um, and actually even less sculpting. So when you have a big target like this, and you guys can still see my slides, right? Is that, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, when you have a, like a target like this, you, you're trying to sculpt a dose around uh, around here. So you need uh, multiple shots to get, to get the dose to have that same shape. Um, like if we assume, if we just, uh, just, just say this as a target, you can just put like one or two shots in here for a small target and then you'll cover it and that'll be good enough. Um, so size is a big indicator of it. But now that's because um, I've taken location out of the equation with this project because we picked a single site and this site is vestibular schwannoma which uh, occurs in a very predictable area so it doesn't differ that much by location except if it's on the left side or the right side so i was a little bit strategic with this data set um, and that's because uh, predicting treatment parameters hasn't been done before. So we wanted to try a, a simple case before going to other sites. Um, so really taken the, the location outside of the equation. But I would imagine that once you include location, uh, that'll also impact the performance of the model. And um, it might even be better to have a model to initially segment and identify where the targets are and then center them as we have here to predict the parameters rather than trying to do it all at once. Um, that would be my guess at how to challenge that or how to, how to take on that challenge. Um, but I, I think both would, would affect it. In this case, only, only size. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, for the segmentation part. Uh, so how do you get the best image of out of that DICOM uh, file that you are showing, uh, the CT scan that you are showing? Uh, do you feed all the all the images or uh, it's like a ZF file? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, this can put yeah. yeah, so these these models were 3D neural networks. So the entire 3D stack was used as input and the output is also a 3D volume. Um, there, there's been some work to show that there are cases when 3D networks outperform 2D networks um, and there are trade-offs there, but yeah, we, we used a 3D network. Does that answer your question? Did I, is that what you were asking? And also, how do you measure the accuracy then? Uh, like the yeah, so um, three common ways of doing it. Um, well, there's dice score. So dice score is a metric of kind of uh, overlap and non-overlap. Um, there is percent volume difference. So you can just look at how the volume changes, but this lacks um, some of the uh, spatial information. And then there is a distance metric, uh, which uh, looks at the boundaries of the target and based off of how close the boundaries are together in terms of this maximum distance apart, you can quantify uh, segmentation tasks. Uh, these are very common metrics, uh, but there are obviously, you know, variations of each of those or combinations of them. Okay, yeah, thank you. Hello, Dr. Nana. Thank you for your uh, talk. Um, I was wondering, when it comes to AI in medicine, you went back to the beginning when you did kind of a prediction of your AI was better than the actual physicist's prediction, physician's prediction. Um, how does that work kind of in a medical sense or in a medical thing? Like, do you usually defer to the physician or the AI? Does that create different sorts of problems within the community itself or? Yeah, um, I definitely don't have an answer to that question, uh, but I, I like talking about it. Um, so the reason why uh, AI has been shown in, uh, like AI has been shown to outperform humans in breast cancer detection is because we have so much data from mammography screenings. Um, they're, you know, like, uh, like from, from the 80s, uh, mammogram programs have been implemented and um, we have longitudinal data looking at, at, at these uh, breast detection. So, so we're able to demonstrate that we can, because of the sufficient amount of data and the cases that we've looked at, that we can develop these models to outperform humans. Um, now, how that's used is, is its own field. And um, you almost, you almost wanna, like it, so it, it's still, there aren't radiology clinics that only use AI, which this paper shows that you could do that. Like you could open up a radiology clinic uh, mammography screening and not hire any any doctors and just run these models on the images and you will detect just as many cancers probably more than if you had actual doctors there so you could do that but it's not being done anywhere and then the question is why is it not being done anywhere which is maybe your question at its core um, and there are uh, a lot of it stems to um, insurance reasons and uh, perceptions of how to best use these programs. And um, I think it's an evolving field that will try and balance itself out in terms of how much AI should we have and human intervention. Um, but I'm a strong believer that it's not going to be one or the other. I think it's going to be the combination of two. So I would love for um, well, like what, what I would choose for, for my mother and my sister, if they were having a mammogram is a radiologist that knows how to interpret, um, computer, uh, predictions rather than a radiologist that totally neglects computer predictions or just a computer prediction. I would, uh, I would pick a radiologist that understands what these models are saying. And again, that's where data scientists become really integral in medicine, 
because it's hard to do that as a doctor when you also have a lot of other things to worry about. You need its own. You need somebody with um, with the know how and the background that you guys have its own specialty to be able to contribute to that. But that's a long way of saying I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you guys have some kind of maybe last question for, for Tommy? So over there? No? Okay. Tommy, we thank you and we hope to meet you next uh, Friday. I hope that they let you into the US. Yeah, I hope so too. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'd love to chat with you guys more about all of this stuff. Um, I think it's really exciting. And um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for having me and listening to my talk. Thank you. Thank you.